So my students have been working on a summary of one article on either Hiroshima or Godzilla. And at this point, I just want to stop and say, okay, well, why have we been doing this so far? What was the purpose of focusing on writing a summary if the goal of this course is to write a research paper in slow motion? And to do that, I'm just going to walk through the planning phase of my writing process, the writing process that I recommend to my students. This is a four-week plan, or it could be a four-day plan, or it could be, if you were working on something really big, a four-month plan, or if you're a graduate student, heck, it could be a four-year plan, you know, you're going to, uh, a process, I should say, a four-year process. So th this process starts with planning, moves on to shaping, moves on to drafting, and then finally revision, but these steps in this process tend to be organic. We move back and forth between them. They're permeable. We don't stop planning once we start shaping. We don't stop shaping once we're in the drafting uh, portion of it. And during the revision process, Lord knows we can jump back all the way to planning. Um, but I wanted to highlight for my students and anyone who's been listening along why I start with a summary. So we've talked about how They Say, I Say, the one of the textbooks for this course, encourages us to enter the conversation. Now, we can, you know, students will enter the conversation. I remember when I was uh, in my undergraduate and even to some degree when I was doing my master's, my idea of entering the conversation was to do the reverse of what I've got listed here for planning. So for planning, we're supposed to gather ideas and determine focus. But I would determine focus and then I would gather ideas. And that would run me into trouble quite often because if you can't find what you need for your focus, then how can you write that research paper? How can you accomplish something when a prof is asking you to have a certain number of sources, articles, chapters, books, to rely upon those if your focus is perhaps too limiting or it's just flat out wrong, right? The reason no one's written on it is because no one in that field would assume that position. Or in some cases, it might just be too new. Okay, so in, when, we're, when we're writing a research paper, most of the time, our profs ask us to go and read articles or to source articles for our paper. And what many writers will do is they'll go and find articles that support an idea that they have, and then they'll strip mine those for quotations. Or worse yet, they will write their paper out of their own brain, which is impressive, but not a research paper. And then they just find places to sort of crowbar in what they think are relevant quotations. And this is a, you know, th this can work. We can get lucky and this can work, but it can also backfire on us if our focus, as I say, is something that cannot be substantiated by the sources that we need for the assignment. And it might just be that you're, you're brilliant enough uh, or that you've read widely enough prior to the course to be able to talk about whatever your topic is in a way that doesn't really need those secondary sources. But if your profs has signed a research paper and says you need to use a certain number of sources, then you can't do that. You, you, you've got to come into this by this planning process. Uh, Face and in the order that I've got it here, to first gather ideas, and only once you've gathered ideas do you then determine your focus. But again, students will just rush and they'll they'll skim read stuff and they don't really absorb it. And I've had students quote articles, misquote them effectively, because they are quoting the article quoting someone else. And the article isn't quoting that someone else in support of what they're saying, but rather as an example of someone they are disagreeing with, what they say, I say, calls a naysayer. And so they'll say, so-and-so argues, and I'm like, no, they absolutely don't. They're just quoting this other person 
as a way of demonstrating that there is a, you know, there's a counter argument to what's being said, and then they go on to defeat that counter argument. But if all we're doing is strip mining our articles, chapters, etc., for quotes, we may misrepresent what our source is saying. Now, most of the time, because the areas that we're studying and the bodies of literature that surround them are so vast, you will likely get away with that because your prof won't know it. But every now and again, that's going to bite you in the tail. So, and, and, and never mind all of these things. I'm, I'm talking about it as though it's like a thing you can get away with. But that's really the wrong approach if, at, at the outset. That's the wrong approach out the gates. As I've said before, a research paper is an opportunity to learn something that we didn't have time to explore fully in lectures. A research paper is an opportunity for you to follow up something that you're interested in and to learn more about it. Okay, So the reason that I have students summarize in the planning stage for this course where we're stretching the whole thing out, I don't actually think that someone will always have the time to summarize entire articles. I don't summarize other people's articles when I'm referencing them in my own work. But the, the goal of the assignment is to ensure that you have entered the conversation and really listened to what your article is saying. The summary guarantees a depth of listening that mirrors the sort of listening that we should be doing every time we do research, every time we pick up an article. I shouldn't just be skim reading my sources. I should be reading with them and engaging with them and sort of arguing with them in the margins, making little notes like, I don't know if I agree with this or this is excellent and I highlight stuff, that annotated sort of reading. So I use the summary as a way of ensuring that students learn to read closely, but also to learn the value of summary. Because as I've said before, just quoting, just quoting doesn't get us all the way there. And if we, wanna, if we want to uh, compile a large amount of information, then summary is the skill set that we need. And I know I'm ham I've hammered this one a few times. We demonstrate greater mastery of content through summary than we do through quotation, okay? So uh, that's, that's the reason that I, I, I have my students summarize the, this, this first article as a stage and that that, it, that represents, in large part, what I think the planning stage should be about, that we're gathering ideas and then we're determining focus. So the goal of the, the, goal of the course is to write a researched argument. And that, that researched argument it will ultimately use three, four, maybe even five articles, depending on how precocious the student feels. Um, and we will build towards this in upcoming lectures. Uh, but right now, my students just have one of these. But then they're going to do another assignment. They're going to get a second one. Then they're going to, we're going to get to the third stage, and I'm going to give them a third one. And then they're going to have to go and find a fourth one on their own. So to, so to my students, I feel like I'm talking to a whole bunch of people who aren't my students when my students are really the only people who listen to this stuff. Uh, well, my mom and dad, too. But um, you have one article out of what you will need to have at least three by the time you get to the researched argument. And when you do papers for other courses, they'll often ask you for three, four, maybe five in your first years at university. Once you get up to upper level courses, they're going to ask for more. Now, this isn't a hard and fast rule, but it's a decent rule of thumb to remember that if you look at your word count and divide it by 250, you'll get roughly the page count. And you should have about one source per page but not more. That doesn't mean that you have to tank it all the way up to five if you're writing a five-page paper. It simply means it would be ill-advised to go beyond five in a five-page paper because once you have too many sources, there's no room for your voice, right? So for my students right now with a summary, it's not your voice. It's the voice of either Gar Alperovitz or Steve Rifle that we're working with. But down the road, there's going to have to be room for your voice. So you don't want to work with too many articles, you don't want to have too many sources, because then 
there's no space for you to talk. You're just quoting everybody else and stringing those quotes together. And that doesn't really form a strong argument, a strong uh, thesis. But you, you have to forecast. You have to look at what the assignment is and say, okay, well, what do I need to do? How many articles do I need? You know, what sort of argument am I constructing here? That sort of thing. And then you head in that direction. And I want, and th that's what the purpose of this lecture is, is to say to my students, hey, let's check in about our long goal in this course. So you're writing the summary right now, you're turning it in uh, right around the corner. Where is all of this going? Because you got to think ahead. We, we need to know where the trip takes us so that we can ensure that we'll get there. So, it, you know, in bold text here, you will use at least three relevant scholarly sources for this assignment. Now, we're gathering those sources right now as a as a way of you know me teaching you how we gather ideas before we determine focus let's talk momentarily about what a research paper is so that again we can jump forward and think about where all of this is going uh, I've talked already about what a summary paper is next week we're going to be talking about what a synthesis paper is what's a research paper it's a synthesis of ideas. Okay, so right there, you might go, wait a second. You just told me we're going to be doing synthesis next week. Yeah, I differentiate the synthesis and the research paper at the end of the semester as a way of making sure that those stay distinct in your mind. But ultimately, what we're about to start with the synthesis is a research paper using only two sources. All right. It is a synthesis of ideas from different sources. And, and again, you have to just think back to what I was just talking about. Uh, if all we're doing is quote mining, are we really synthesizing ideas? Like if we say this person says this and this other person says this other thing and they've said some stuff and then we, we you know, students always struggle with conclusions. And I think they struggle with conclusions because their, their papers don't say anything. They haven't synthesized information. They haven't pulled it all together. They're like, hey, there's a bunch of people talking about stuff here. Um, but as the next point says here, it should involve a central argument. So, you know, having a, having a focus and then going and finding sources for it doesn't help us get that central argument. But if we read what others have said and we respond to what they're saying, and then we construct a central argument, then that emerges organically from the process. Um, and the central argument in a research paper for this course, at the very least, it should be your central argument or position. Okay. Now, sometimes profs will ask you to not say what you think. And not just in a summary sort of way. They're going to say, I want you to synthesize this person's thoughts and this person's thoughts. And I want you to tell me what conclusion we might come to based upon that information. That is, incidentally, what you will be doing with the synthesis. Um, there is a sort of implicit opinion on our part when we derive, like when we come up with what we think these you know, two sources say when we put them together. That's us working too, but it's it, our voice is more present in most research papers where, you know, the, the prof is asking for our central argument or position. And I'm bringing this up now, even at a point where you're writing a summary where it isn't about your central argument or position, but it's Rifle's central argument or position, or it's Alperovitz's uh, central argument or position. Because again, you got to know where we're headed or you can't start thinking about where you want to go. As you emerge from having written the summary, what do you think about your subject matter? What do you think about what Gar Alperovitz and going back a little bit further, Michael Milam have had to say about Hiroshima? How are you responding to that? They say, I say, entering the conversation and looking for a place where we can enter it. How would you enter this argument? What, would, what do you want to say? On the Godzilla track, what do you think about what Steve Rifle has to say? And going back, brothers, they have similar uh, ideas about the movie Godzilla. And if you watched the movie uh, on E-Reserve, what do you think about it? What, are you, what, what, what position would you want to take if you had to write this research paper? Not, you know, two months from now, but two weeks from now. Um, and then 
finally, university research papers almost always require scholarly secondary sources, which we've talked about already in this course. And everything that you're using in this course is a scholarly secondary source. It's not a web article. It's not somebody's blog. It's not somebody's podcast. It's not, you know, just a YouTube uh, video. And I say all of this while I know full well that I'm giving this information out on a podcast and a YouTube video. Um, but you know, uh, and, I, and I have to admit what I'm doing right here, this isn't peer reviewed. I don't have editors, you know, coming in and making sure that I've, you know, adjusted all of this stuff. Sure, I'm an expert in my field, but this still isn't a scholarly source. It's a lecture. Um, you can cite and quote lectures, by the way, if you ever feel like you need to on a research paper, there is a way to do that. Check your MLA style guide in your textbook. Um, but University research papers are almost going, always going to require scholarly secondary sources. So let's review what a scholarly secondary source is. Um, and this goes hand in hand with one of the concepts that I have for what makes a great research paper. A great paper has evidence. Uh, you support your argument with relevant and compelling content from your primary, what's a primary source? Uh, we'll talk about that in just a second, and or secondary sources. So you support your argument with relevant and compelling content from your primary and or secondary sources. This evidence is delivered as quotations, summary, and paraphrase. So we paraphrase people, we quote them, we summarize them, and every time we do, and I stress this heavily, we have to cite that information. A lot of people think that the only time that you cite your sources when you quote them, that's not true. You quote them whenever you reference them, be that paraphrase, summary, and with quotation, not just quotations. Um, so we have evidence for our argument is the idea here. And in university, we prize the scholarly secondary source over other types of secondary sources. Like we can find secondary sources all over the web or in magazines. I have uh, an issue of uh, Time magazine that's devoted to Godzilla. It's just about Godzilla. Is that a scholarly source? No, absolutely not. A scholarly source is often also called a peer-reviewed source. What that means is, is that when someone like me publishes an academic article or a chapter, or if I was to write an academic book, um, then I have to run that by a editorial board of other experts. That's what the peer thing means. The peers are other experts in the field that I'm writing about. And so they would give feedback and say, well, the argument's weak here because, as you know, so-and-so has said this other thing, or did you know that there's new information about this, and it, it, it kind of goes against what you're saying, or this is really good, and may I suggest this other thing as a follow-up to a concept that you have here. And it, it, it doesn't always ensure that the information is perfect, because I've read some scholarly sources that I flat-out disagree with, but sometimes that's just approach. Like they're approaching how they read film or, or literature in ways that I don't subscribe to. Uh, but they have been run through this rigorous process by which the end result isn't just that person's opinion, but it is that person's position on this issue uh, supported by other sources quite often. In fact, we are using peer-reviewed sources in our peer-reviewed sources. <laughs> so that's what we mean when we say we want you to use a scholarly secondary source. Is Time Magazine a terrible publication? No. Can I use anything from that Time Magazine about Godzilla? Like if I wanted to write about Godzilla um, using Time Magazine, could I do it? You have to check with your profs. If most of the time, if you have already checked off the boxes, like so let's, uh, so for this assignment, you have to have three scholarly sources. Three scholarly sources. Once you've got those three sources and you're really engaging with them, not just quoting them a little bit and then using, say, the Time Magazine article extensively, but, but in really engaging with those three peer-reviewed sources, I, at least, and I, I think there are a number of profs uh, out there who would do the same, will say, yeah, you can absolutely use another source if it, you know, comes into conversation with these ones that you already have. But we want you to build the core of the argument out of peer-reviewed scholarly secondary sources. And again, what's the difference between a primary and a secondary source? Well, in the case of Godzilla, the primary source is the film, 
and the secondary source is an article like Godzilla's Footprint by Steve Rifle. So scholarly secondary sources are um, journal articles, footnotes in scholarly versions of certain books, like if you're looking at an, uh, 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 the text of one of Shakespeare's plays, sometimes they'll come with a, you know, a bunch of footnotes down the bottom to explain the Elizabethan language. And those footnotes are scholarly sources. Uh, introductions in scholarly versions. So again, if I have a scholarly version of Shakespeare's Hamlet, then there may be an introduction by a scholar, a Shakespearean scholar. Um, and so there's, you know, there's all sorts of scholarly editions of books. And then scholarly essays, which we, you know, sometimes find either in journals or in uh, anthologies. Like I've contributed to anthologies on steampunk. And, uh, you know, they have my essays on uh, steampunk in them. Uh, and then books on the primary source. So books about Godzilla. Um, I have a book by a guy named David Callett, which is a review of the Godzilla films all the way from uh, 1954's Godzilla right up to Godzilla Final Wars. I think that was back in 2004. So it's like this expansive look and he takes a scholarly uh, view on these things. And that book would would fit the scholarly secondary source approach. Now, there is another way that we can do this that I don't have listed here where Say, you know, I want to write about Godzilla and I find a scholarly source that's just about giant monster movies in general or disaster movies or science fiction movies that may talk about giant monster movies. Um, those also work in a broader sort of way. And, you know, if we think about really recent Godzilla movies, we don't have scholarly work on them like the, the Godzilla vs. King Kong movie that came out earlier this year. Is there going to be scholarly work on that? It's very unlikely. But I could take other scholarly work that's been done broadly about giant monster movies or what we'll find out later in the semester when we get to Susan Sontag's essay on the imagination of disaster is called that very thing, the imagination of disaster. So I might find scholarly work on that in particular. And you can extrapolate this to the Hiroshima side just by saying, looking for journal articles about Hiroshima, footnotes and scholarly versions, again, all of that stuff, and then books on the primary source, books about Hiroshima written by scholars, um, historians, but I also might just find books that are about World War II or books that are about the development of the atomic bomb. And those will, will have information for me as well. Now, I don't recommend for our introductory course that you go and try to read, you know, entire books. You don't have the time. Okay. Uh, I always used to think, man, I'm going to, you know, I'd go to the library and I'd be like, I'm going to read this book and I'm going to read this book and I'm going to read this book. And I never had the time. I always had the best of intentions, but I never had the time. Um, and if I did read the books, I usually hurt my chances of writing a really good research paper because I was wasting the time I should have been doing focused research, doing a lot of reading, which was great for my education, but it wasn't so good for my grades always. So gathering ideas. So what is a scholarly secondary source? Uh, let's just run down this, the secondary sources for the Godzilla track that we're going to be using this semester. Because again, this is forecasting. This is us looking ahead. And um, also thinking of our entire project as the research paper in slow motion. So let's speed it up ever so briefly to say, okay, I start with Japan's Nuclear Nightmare by Peter H. Brothers. Imagine you're writing a research paper in a course where you only have four weeks to do it, and in your first week, you find Japan's Nuclear Nightmare by Peter Brothers. You find Godzilla's Footprint by Steve Rifle. You find Godzilla and Post-War Japan by William Tsutsui. And then you find The Imagination of Disaster by Susan Sontag. Okay? Um, and now you've got four sources. Now, the, the assignment only requires three, but you've got four. And you read through those four, and you feel like there's a conversation going on there, because there is. Um, but maybe, you know, when you're doing research, you're going to come across articles 
where you realize that it's topically relevant, but not thesis relevant. Like the, the focus that is emerging from what you're working on doesn't cohere with the other stuff. One of these things is not like the other and you chuck it out. Okay, so that, and, and that could even happen with these articles, as we'll see later in the semester. You might find that it's unnecessary to have both brothers and rifle because they say the same thing. Or you might find that Tsutsui isn't as essential as you thought because he goes beyond the 54 Godzilla film to talk about uh, the entire Godzilla series. Uh, Susan Sontag might not work for you because it's, it, her, her writing isn't particularly about Godzilla. It's about the imagination of disaster. She only mentions Godzilla ever so briefly. But the reason that I put it in bold here is you will be required to use it for your research paper. And we'll explore why later on. Uh, but for now, just know Susan Sontag presents a bit of a naysayer to Brothers Rifle and Tsutsui. Let's turn over to the Hiroshima side of things. What's a scholarly secondary source over there? Again, we're speeding, we're speeding up the timeline and imagining that in the first week of writing a paper in which you only have four weeks, you collect these sources. You find Michael Milam's Hiroshima and Nagasaki 65 years later. You find Hiroshima historians reassessed by Garel Perovitz. You find the shock of the atomic bomb and Japan's decision to surrender or reconsideration by Sadeo Asada. And again, I want to stress those words there. I mean, just look at that. Reassess, reconsideration. Uh, the work of academia is to change our, not minds, but our stance, our position, and ultimately our minds um, when we are presented with new data. If we have new information that contradicts what we've known to be true prior, then we alter that. We shift things around. We deal with the new information, consequences be damned. Um, and, and then we've got Donald Kagan's Why America Dropped the Bomb, and I want Donald Kagan just like I want Susan Sontag, I want Don Donald Kagan in conversation with your other sources. We've got four sources. We only need three. Maybe we ditch one. But here's the thing. If I only need three sources, but I turn in a paper that's got four, is that a bad thing? Not necessarily. It's bad if there's no room in my argument for my voice and the assignment requires that. It's good if I am synthesizing great information in ways that support my stance. But if all I'm doing is just getting a fourth article because I think that's going to make me look shiny to my prof, that's a bad strategy. You shouldn't include more articles just because you think that qua quantity is going to somehow give you a better mark. It's always going to be about quality. And a quality argument is about having content that coheres. As we gather our ideas, reading our articles closely, absorbing what they say, synthesizing their information, and then and only then determining our focus will produce better papers. So here I've got Kagan, Alperovitz, and Asada. Three articles. I, I eliminated Milam from the equation there uh, because I don't, I don't think Milam would fit with what I would want to do if I was to write on the Hiroshima track. I'd want to stick with Garal Perovitz's position that America didn't have to drop the bomb. Um, and when we get to Sadeo Asada, we find that he questions that position. Uh, and then Kagan enters the whole fray and it's a little bit of both. Um, and so we get three very strong positions. Uh, and, and I'm checking off the boxes of the assignment, the research assignment for this course. You will use at least three relevant scholarly sources for the research paper that we're going to do at the end of the semester. But again, I just want you to stop for a moment. Imagine that you only have four weeks. In the first week, the planning week, you're gathering ideas, you're determining your focus, you take Kagan, you take Alperovitz, and you take uh, Asada, and you formulate a tentative thesis based upon your synthesis of their information. Synthesis is a blending together of ideas, right? A thesis is a statement or theory that is put forward as a premise, as a premise to be maintained, potentially, or proved. But there's, there's you know, I'm saying formulate a tentative thesis. Don't go in and say, this is going to be my thesis and refuse to have your mind changed. Instead, as I've said a million times, but I, gotta, I just, you know, I'm going to hit this one, gather ideas, 
develop a thesis from that, a tentative thesis. You might even develop a tentative thesis from your first article. Some of you did. You read, you read Michael Milam's article and you formed an opinion, a very strong opinion about the Hiroshima event. And then you read Al Perovitz and maybe that reinforced that position. So you have a thesis rolling around in your head, but please, please, please make it a tentative one. Because we have to be open to the possibility that our initial articles may be wrong or that they may have information that is old data, right? And this is, this is part of what I talk about in my list of great paper criteria, that a great paper is focused. A great paper is focused. A tentative thesis is, is, is better focused than no focus at all, right? You have a clear argument and only use content that advances that argument. Not that's topically relevant, not like, you know, the whole Greek food, Greek gods, Greek government thing. You have a clear argument and only use content that advances that argument. When using secondary sources, you only summarize, paraphrase, and quote the most relevant evidence. You don't just like jam stuff in there and go like, well, it's about Hiroshima or it's about Godzilla. Every year, students go and find this article about this weird postmodern book called Gojiro, Gojiro Gojira or something like that. It's a very strange book. I tried reading it. It's bizarre. But they'll take that article and they try to use it on a paper about the movie Godzilla. And I'm like, this is not relevant. This is not relevant. And it stuns me that, that students don't see the error that they're making in that particular case. Don't do that. Okay. And you might find the same thing with Michael Milan because his whole, his thesis was really ultimately about dehumanization. And maybe the, the, uh, the paper that you end up writing about Hiroshima ends up not being about that, right? So we want to stay focused. So we formulate a tentative thesis, and then we ask some of these questions. Is your thesis too obvious? If you cannot come up with interpretations that oppose your own, consider revising. Like, we don't want Godzilla is a giant monster. That's not a thesis that we need to explore. No one's going to contest that. But when Rifle says Godzilla is a classic film, uh, and it's replete with meaning, it's deep and metaphorical, we can probably find people who go, eh, I don't know. Or if he says, this movie's really great, and the special effects are amazing, and then we watch it and we go, eh, I don't know, right? Then we can see that perhaps we've got a thesis that's got some controversy involved. And we, we don't want to go out of our way to find the most controversial thing we could possibly say, like Godzilla is actually a metaphor for baseball. Um, <laughs> that's ridiculous. <laughs> Nobody is going to agree with that. Uh, everybody's going to contest it. It's not worth exploring, right? It needs to be something that's ultimately supportable. Can you support your thesis with evidence? Ta-da! Right? And, and, I, and the reason I bring this up, and I mean, obviously, Godzilla being a metaphor for baseball is, is utterly ridiculous. But every now and again, I get students who go that route because they get this impression in their, in their heads that, that what they're supposed to do in university is to come up with the most batshit thesis that they possibly can and then support that with a bunch of, like, half-baked theories um, or, you know, some wild philosophical position. And they think that that's writing a research paper. And it's like, you don't have to reinvent the wheel in your undergraduate. A lot of the time, what we're looking for on our papers in the undergraduate is that you demonstrate a mastery of the content that we are teaching you. So you don't have to go out and on some crazy wild limb, right? You can, you can state things that you've learned in the course, that you've explored through the course. Does the thesis require an essay's worth of development? That's important. But... On the other side, is the thesis too broad? Is it beyond an essay's worth of development? Like we want it to at least hit whatever the page count or the word count is, but we don't want it to be so big that we can't fit it into the five, six pages that it's probably going to need to fit in. So refining our thesis and, and determining focus is so important. And as you go through the writing process, you'll probably find that you're whittling stuff away, that you, you carve away. But on the other side, right, can you, you know, it, does this require an essay's worth of development? Is it really something, does it have enough to fill the pages, as it were? Can you explain why readers might want to read an essay 
with this thesis. Now, this is the believing game from the say I say to some degree, uh, the believing game in, in summarizing. Even if you don't think it's interesting, could you make it? Could you imagine somebody somewhere out there might want to read it? Like maybe you're not a fan of Godzilla or maybe you're not really interested in Hiroshima, but can you imagine that someone is? I mean, you're reading articles by people who are. So you can go, okay, well, somebody was interested in this. So what kind of person would be interested in it? And what, what would I say to them, right? Imagining a reader is an important part of uh, formulating our thesis and, and having uh, a good plan. This is a photo that a, a former student sent me of uh, their whiteboard, her whiteboard, uh, when she was working on a paper about Godzilla. And you can see here, I mean, you know, a little drawing of Godzilla up in the corner, but just a ton of bits of information just written all over the place. And this is that student trying to imagine where they're going to go with their paper. Uh, and we'll talk more about this when we get to the shaping uh, aspect of, of the writing process. But for now, just know when you're planning, it's good to do mind maps and brainstorm and just, you know, sort of get that information out on a page. Start working with it in ways that are interactive on your part. And again, writing the summary is part of that. Long goal, though, is to add these sources together and come up with a thesis. So you need that tentative thesis rolling around in your head even now. But as we add sources to your, uh, your arsenal, your cache, your uh, bag of information to your brain, um, how does it refine your thesis? Right? When we add uh, Gar al to Sadao Asada next week, how does that change what we might say about Hiroshima? So writing a research paper is source plus source plus source equals what? That's what we should be doing. Source plus source plus source equals what? Not, I've come up with this brilliant idea and now I found sources to support it proven. No, that's proof texting, not research. And we're seeing that all over the place on the internet these days with people wanting to prove things that there isn't good evidence for. The imagination of disaster by Susan Sontag plus Godzilla's footprint plus Godzilla in post-war Japan equals what? So source plus source plus source equals what? And we want, we want to explore that as we move towards the research paper at the end of the semester. So right now we're just in that planning phase. We're gathering ideas, we're determining focus. If this was another course, we'd probably only have a week to do all of this. We've taken a month and we're going to move on now. We're still going to be in that planning phase because like I said, these are permeable states. So we're going to add another article next week and then we're going to explore how that changes our thesis or revises our thesis, expands our thesis, changes what we've been thinking. Uh, that's the best research and writing process that we can engage in. We can do the other one. It'll get the job done, you know, where we come up with our thesis and then we go and gather the ideas. Lord knows students have been doing it for years. But if we really want the best information and we want to change our minds, if we want the, our money's worth for our tuition and education as opposed to just grades, then we will want to engage in rigorous attention to what others are saying before we determine what it is that we are saying.